Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Prudent Observations, your one-stop shop for all things relating to international relations, geopolitics, and history. Uh, today, we are going to be taking a look at a rather interesting book and text that I think is well worth our time. Uh, often, when we look at the historiography of imperialism, or even just international relations in general, one has to consider which school of thought that that idea comes from. Um, specifically, when we talk about foreign policy, we look at a variety of schools ranging from liberalism, Marxism, constructivism, realism, both offensive and defensive, neorealism, classical, all these sort of things sort of break down into their various schools and their camps. And I thought that it would be very timely, considering that there is so much discussion over America as empire and the status of empire as it is. Are we currently still an empire? Are we looking at the world in a much different brand or lens um, than, say, traditional definitions of empire or imperium? And so I thought that this would be a rather interesting time to, to look at it, because when we consider imperialism, one might consider the idea of uh, John Atkinson Hobson, who's an English economist and social scientist whose writings on the concept of imperialism heavily influenced uh, Vladimir Lenin on his idea of consumption. Um, although he was also a journalist and a correspondent um, during the Second Boer War, had uh, a long sort of backdrop of what is to be considered imperialism. And in his text, Imperialism, which came out in 1902, he had argued that imperialism espoused the idea of new markets. We have to seek out ways in which we are, you know, looking for profit, but also for resources that are not currently available in the home or mother country. In a market-based society, um, sort of the rich who have a disproportionately higher amount of capital to invest in than the working classes, that they would invest their incomes into ways which could seek out international exports and in doing so seek out new territory for that stuff to be conquered. Of course, he's basing this a lot on the domain of thought that already existed inside of the United Kingdom um, and at the time of the empire, as it was, and what was to be done about that. In America, sort of the examination of imperialism has its own school kind of similar to what I think Hobson discusses, and this is best known as the Wisconsin School, although this is more about diplomatic history than it is just, say, straight-up imperialism. But if one is to read the author of this book... William Appleman Williams, uh, you'll know that he's up there along with uh, Tom McCormick, Lloyd Gardner, um, I think Walter Faber's in that list, or Le LeFaber, um, and they sort of begin to examine the historiography of the American empire. Now, I've done quite a few of these shows in the past on what does it mean to have an empire in America, and what does the rise of imperialism look at? Um, most specifically, we've taken a look at the open door policy um, on this channel. We've also looked at the concept of the Monroe Doctrine. Those ideas are very much um, expanded upon in this text. And so I guess we should begin by sort of arguing or discussing what, what book are we, are we covering? Um, and this book specifically is... Um, Empire as a Way of Life. It was written in 1979. It came out in uh, 1980, prior to the election um, of Ronald Reagan is when it came out. And I have a, an updated edition, which was published in 2006, the one that you have here, um, with an introduction by Andrew uh, Basevich, who used to be a quite well-known in foreign policy circles. And this is both an interesting criticism of imperialism, but also offers a considerable amount of historiography behind it. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is that there is a substantial amount of evidence, both the primary and secondary sources, both of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries of both sort of the Anglo concept of empire and how to advance it, and also what did the Americans think of themselves. 
I know that there are some that take a substantial bit of objection to, say, the ultra-Calvinist thesis that you will see in an open letter to open-minded progressives and unqualified reservations by Curtis Yarvin, but he's not coming up with that by himself. He is more or less citing the sort of American founding fathers alongside the um, frontier documentation about how we're going to expand past the Appalachian Mountains and later on past the Mississippi. Uh, much like their English counterparts, there was this concept of new Israelism, that the United States was to be the shining city on the hill, which the good news, the gospel truth could be proclaimed to all nations. And some of that still exists today, even now in its more secularized form of uh, imperialism here in the United States, its idea of hegemony. We must progress a, you know, put forward a progressive gospel truth, a way of life in order to do so. Now, this is, of course, um, you know, Williams is, of course, a part of what you might call sort of the, um, uh, I guess, new left or maybe old left nowadays. I don't even know if the new left has anything to offer in 2023 in terms of what academic stuff is being put out. But he offers this alongside another book, which um, we will cover in the coming weeks, uh, although this came out in 1962, which is called Tragedy of American Diplomacy. I think it goes quite well alongside Kennan's discussion on American diplomacy, his 1950 text as well. Uh, these two gentlemen, um, both Kennan and Williams, are well worth your time reading. And I think that in order for us to understand how we got to here and the evergreen debate inside the American po body politic about empire, imperialism, and how far are we to go and what are we to rule as, um, we have to understand these people, uh, especially as America finds itself changing, both demographically, both in its politics, and those things are, are well worth your time to consider. So today we're going to be reviewing this book, um, and I'm guessing I'm going to, I guess, spoil it in its entirety, but first we're going to be taking a look at uh, sort of the backdrop for why Williams wrote it. Secondly, we'll be taking a look at the historiography behind it, the idea of America living as an empire, as a way of life. And you can kind of understand this uh, new left historiography when you look at the sort of old right 1920s pre-Great um, Depression writers like Garrett Garrett, who wrote famously Rise of Empire, Ex America, and uh, The Revolution Was, and The People's Pottage, which I still cite quite all the time. So we're going to be taking a look at this. And afterwards, we're going to get to the last section of the book, which contains a few essays and some few thoughts of his that try and articulate, can we reach any reasonable level of restraint? Something that we've talked about on this channel and of my work before in foreign policy, can restraint be achieved? Or in a very Faustian-like manner, will empire continue to exist at all times across all borders and inevitably... Um, Mephistopheles will come home to roost, and that may come with a great deal of destruction. And these are the things that Williams is writing about in 1979 and in 1980. This comes in the backdrop of two things. This comes in the backdrop of already witnessing the Cuban Missile Crisis and alongside the American withdrawal after years of bloody fighting inside of Vietnam. Um, he was one of many historians to rethink the Cold War and wondered how much of this was at a cost of American imperialism in comparison to what are we to do with uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and in turn, you know, the, the Vietnam War was neither democratizing nor liberty um, spreading. The, no, no benefit came from it. And he argues that that kind of questioning came even earlier when it came to the 1950s. That as America began to look at itself in the post-World War II era, what are we really to do? Um, and then, of course, the Korean War comes along. So those are going to be the things that we're going to look at today. Uh, I know that some of you may know Williams and his work. I was already told by Radlib when I was covering this that it's good that someone is covering it. But none nonetheless, I think that it is important for us to look at this work and to realize that these debates about what the American foreign policy is has been a subject of core identitarian, you know, not just like identitarian in an ethnic sense, but the identity of the nation as a whole. Um, you know, we, we like to think of ourselves, at least on some parts of the right, to have these 
small state identities or regional identities or what is the American identity. These things get debated all the time, both at home and abroad. And we're going to be taking a look at that in full. So this book is broken down into quite a few chapters. Uh, it's a very short read. You can read it in one sitting, I think, in a matter of hours, if you're willing to take the time. I took a couple of days to go over this, just in part because I thought it was rather important for us to consider just uh, a lot of the sources that he cites here. There are nine chapters, of course, that are brought into this book um, with a long introduction that uh, empire is a way of life for us. And we have an imperial lifestyle that Americans, unlike anywhere else in the world, have really enjoyed the benefits of even now into its modern age. Um, the first several chapters, of course, are on the ideas that the American people, specifically its Anglo uh, founders, were ones to be born and bred of empire. Um, of course, we start taking a look at uh, the idea of uh, economy as a mechanism, of course, of spreading empire, the revolution for the United States, and the imperial logic that came with freedom, expansion, and empire, with a serious consideration for Frederick Turner Jackson before looking at the Second World War and onward. If you have a copy of this book, you will notice that there are several appendices, which I will read some later on as we go into it, that cite are uh, numerous interventions. Um, he sort of has three major ones, including our time during the pre-World War II era, um, our time in the turn of the century, and then, of course, our time in the 19th and early um, 18th century, or late 18th century as well. This is partly why I find covering things like the War with the Barbary States, which we've covered on an episode of Prudent Observations before, I highly recommend that you look at it, alongside the open door policy, which is, um, to Williams's view, the real shift from America looking at the frontier domestically and then looking towards it in a more outward fashion. Although at the same time, we were doing both. Um, the United States was quickly looking at how on earth we can maintain and secure our own blessings in a very ethnic, providential mindset at home, but also at the same time, how can we um, police our interests abroad, even when we were still an incredibly small, underpowered country, um, punching well above its weight. So let's uh, get into the text itself. I think that there's some important things for us to consider as well. So starting off with taking a look at the English, the imperial outlook and strategy was not seriously challenged by a coalition of interests or classes between 1640 and 1649 made the English revolution and created a Republican Commonwealth led by Oliver Cromwell. It is conceivable, but highly improbable that if the levelers and other radicals within the revolutionary movement had won control, they would have freed the American colonies and ended their other imperial ventures and settled down to cultivate their domestic commonwealth. Not only were they children of an imperial way of life, but they were also vigorously busy as evangelists to their particular way of truths. And as the United States is to demonstrate, there is neither a logical nor pragmatic connection between more freedom at home and less empire abroad. And I think this sort of sets ourselves up for what we're looking at here. He also offers the strong influence that John Locke has on English politics, both at home and abroad citing that Englishmen uh, of all classes and stripes could look and find something in John Locke. Locke, of course, he writes, was at the center of English politics, both as an advisor to high officials and a philosopher who evoked a wide public response from 1660 until the end of the century. He is important in the development of empire as a way of life, not because he was unique, but because he expressed the contradictions of the imperial outlook with a special verve, clarity, and style, and because he influenced a large number of Americans as well. Englishmen on both sides of the Atlantic responded to him, for if he expressed and clarified the basic elements of their attitudes and thoughts, the concerns in responsible, balanced, and even limited limited liberty, the assumption that progress depended upon coordinated, even planned action, and the belief that, given the finite nature of the world, domestic welfare and social peace required vigorous imperial expansion. Riches do not consist in having gold, more gold or silver, but having more in proportion to the rest of the world or than our neighbors, whereby we are enabled to procure ourselves a greater plenty of the conveniences of life that comes within the reach of neighboring kingdoms and states." End quote. Um, we sort of begin to see the basic tenets of a political reality in here that still exists even today within the realist school. 
We have to understand that realism in itself really only begins to emerge in a post-war consensus, although you could argue it goes back even earlier with Thucydides or with Machiavelli. But the more contemporary literature begins to look at things in a primarily European, Western, nation-state to nation-state framework. And Locke, of course, is well in on this, that, you know, the success to all imperial forms of wealth is to have a proportion of power, wealth, and means to execute that power, um, more so than your neighbors. And Locke, of course, is going to be one of these, um, you know, post-English Revolution, but also sort of post-Reformation, post-Enlightenment thinkers that we sort of begin to emerge, or as an Enlightenment thinker, wherein it influences both the Americans, but even to this day, it influences policymakers at home in the United States and abroad. Um, but to sort of finish off on the first chapter, he argues that on one hand, the American colonies prospered as part of the British Empire and their developing strength, self-consciousness and confidence were essential to moving them to think of revolution and in translating that idea into action. On the other hand, the success of empire produced vast changes within Great Britain, which led to the confrontation with the colonies. That dialectical process provides a classic example not only of the nature of change, but of the interaction between economic activity and political and intellectual and social developments. It produced another culture based on the proposition that expansion was the key to freedom, prosperity, and social peace. We sort of begin to see this market-oriented need for expansion that Williams is going to argue leads to sort of this imperial way of life, and that if we do not cease to do so, um, you know, then what is the idea of freedom to begin with? He'll mention this later on, and we've talked about this when it comes to the Monroe Doctrine, but this idea is ingrained in sort of this American providential culture. Uh, early on, after the Monroe Doctrine had been established very early on in the 1840s, um, that had been discussed by President James K. Polk to support a filibuster in Congress, citing the Monroe Doctrine to support white uh, colonial settlers in the Yucatan Peninsula after fear of um, ethnic extermination by the natives. I do take severe criticism, however, to Williams's definition of the native uh, and indigenous peoples that were here first, uh, the Choctaw, the Iroquois Confederacy. He calls them the first Americans, um, although I, I take issue with that term in part because America as a concept and America as a people and nation state don't really come to fruition as that. And certainly the Americans that founded this country wouldn't have considered them the first either. Um, but sort of that racialized status of the noble versus ignoble savage um, is debated heavily throughout in this text alongside of our um, current foreign policy today. I mean, there is uh, we the idea that somehow we can take someone out of Iraq and Afghanistan and turn them into Thomas Jefferson is very much the kind of thinking that went into the hubris of the global war on terror and also later on its criticisms by those like Ron and Rand Paul or more contemporary thinkers like Barry Posen. Second chapter, however, you know, begins to take a look at sort of the almost a borderline psychoanalysis of what it means to be uh, here in the West and in regards to empire, more specifically Americans. Um, and this is a problem he finds to be very interesting when it comes to the argumentation of how we um, look at ourselves. Um, he, he argues here, he says he's actually working off Marx, although he claims <laughs> Karl Marx remarked, quote, in a phrase that illuminates his exasperated outburst that he was not a Marxist. That the past way is like an alp upon the brain of the living. Old ideas influence a new reality. One could have great fun and perhaps a contribution to wisdom by arguing therein lies the genesis of psychoanalysis. But let us use Marx's insight to guide in exploring the origins of a character of imperial characterization, characterization of its victims. How we perceive our victims tells us much about ourselves. Such overarching ideologies are inher innate, inherently complicated, giving rise to different emphasis and interpretations among historians, sociologists, anthropologists, political theorists, and ethno-historians. We can properly begin, therefore, by outlining these two arguments. He continues saying, quote, The problem confronting the English and other European empire builders was very simple. Even by their own rules, the unilateral, uninvited, unprovoked intrusion over thousands of miles by one culture into a life and affairs of another could not be explained or justified by an appeal to self-defense. That primal right could plausibly be invoked even at best only after the initial penetration had occurred and was resisted. And that, of course, has happened several times throughout the history of American colonialization. <clears throat> 
Hence, the initial invasion must be justified by some other logic. Over the years, scholars dealing with the problem have tended into two separate groups, one emphasizing the importance of color and the other that stresses Christianity. Um, one, of course, having the concept of racial superiority, the other one being that the heathens are the agents of the devil and must be converted and destroyed. There's a mix of both, I think, that definitely penetrates the American ideal, or at least in the 18th uh, and 19th centuries at the very least. Um, he thinks that uh, Williams argues the same thing. He thinks that these are very much uh, mutually supportive and reinforcing for empire as a way of life, uh, regardless of sort of the Levantine and Mediterranean, um, you know, growth of Christianity, its westernized form, what Spangler would call its pseudomorphosis, uh, had allowed it to be sort of a much more, at least in its early years, um, you know, Christendom very early on from, say, 500 to 1789 had a much different um, flavor than what we see now, one of crusades, ma monastic military orders, and understanding that God, king, and country were very real things that were tangible for a political formula that could justify any form of expansion. Um, now, at the same time, Williams argues that these things allow us to now focus on sort of how can we expand ourselves uh, for our posterity, for our own freedom. Uh, these sort of things that allow uh, the American people to begin to sort of formulate here, the English that started it later on, Americans, um, you know, they were, uh, he says they were soft imperialists, religious and secular, um, occasionally racist, arrogant, uh, supercilious, patronizing, but they did separate themselves um, on a variety of issues. Uh, he says that some of the earliest forms of uh, our policy outside of, say, responding in self-defense like King Philip's War was that there was this desire to at least initially civilize them, uh, schools and so on. The The desirable part early on was sort of this concept of the noble savage later on as the wars um, between, say, you know, King's Philip's War or expansions into the Ohio territories. It later became a war with an, a noble, but also a, a savagery and barbarism that had to be put down um, in order, again, to secure their own in turn. And so these sort of logics, you know, argue how we see expansion play out and the rhetoric that we're going to see from both Christian, secular, deist, and other politicians inside the Americans. But of course, one has to consider the heavy role that religion plays in America. There's a great collection. It's a two-volume set of um, political sermons of the American founding from 1860, uh, 19, uh, 1765 to, I think, 1809. Um, it's a great two-volume set. Uh, some of the stuff is in there really understands sort of the American mainline Episcopalian Anglican uh, ideal alongside the Anabaptists and so on. And you really do begin to understand that there is this idea that America will be the place from which God on high can, you know, rule from. Uh, you know, to take a look at things, one has to consider the the work of John Winthrop as an excellent example. Not the Twitter Winthrop, but one to to consider to make the case for the land. Um, with that respect, he says, you know, if we leave them sufficient for their use, we may lawfully take the rest. Williams argues that the rest meaning that wherever they were not located at any given moment, we could take advantage of that through imperial fiat. Winthrop was a soft imperious and hoped to convert the heathen and embrace to embrace their doom. But as a hard imperialist is acquiring the loot. Um, he says, there and elsewhere, empire is ruthless. Even so, all such beliefs and rationalizations which prompted and sanctified numerous imperial wars killed fewer Americans than the diseases imported by their imperial and uh, by the Europeans that came here. Gunfire removed the handy, and prior to the appearance of the Europeans, you know, he argues that there were probably 10 to 12 million people living north of the Rio Grande River. And it seems very likely that given the existence of surplus producing agriculture, uh, that population was increasing. But of course, through the sneeze and the presence there and the great Columbian exchange, uh, things would begin to change. Um, uh, by the time, uh, you know, we see this with uh, people like William Jennings Bryan would later sort of lament this, saying that like, uh, by the time that we had come around, America was more of a, a, a land of widows than it was anything else. But by this time comes around and formulates, we really begin to see from Williams's argumentation that you have this self-reinforcing political, sociological, and religious idealism that makes you think that you can be your own man. Um, we've talked about this on the Old Glory Club, but the King Philip's War is really the North American, New England especially, ethnogenesis for what is a distinctly American identity. You're no longer 
a Englishman here, but you're also an American that has fought off a deleterious war of ethnic extermination, and you managed to come out on top. And you, in turn, want to get what's yours and to expand and to do what is necessary by God and country in order to defend your posterity. There's very much an ethnic element to one's religiosity in these concepts. But each chapter throughout this book has some interesting quotes that I think are rather important to sort of get the mindset of where these people are coming from. Um, you know, a, an anonymous poem from the Virginia Gazette in 1774 had said, Some fitter day shall crown us as masters of the main, in giving laws and freedoms to subject France and Spain, and all the isles o'er the ocean shall tremble and obey, the lords, the lords, the lords of North America. James Madison, in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, wrote, This form of government, the Constitution, in order to effect its purposes, must not operate within a small but extensive sphere. And, of course, uh, Thomas Jefferson's inaugural address in 1801, Our success furnishes a new proof of the falsehood of Montesquieu's doctrine, that a republic can only be preserved in a small territory. The reverse is the truth. And it is this revolution for self-government that sort of emerges here. I know that there is a lot of theses as to what really instigates it. There is sort of an ethnogenesis, uh, the visage of British invincibility, especially towards the Seven Years' War um, or the French and Indian War, if you're an American who grew up with that in the public school system. You really begin to see this facilitation of an identity. And ironically, Williams begins to cite sort of the issue of taxation um, after this war takes place as one of the constraints of empire, because, you know, the, the concern that Locke and Cromwell and ironically also um, Hobson talks about in his 1902 study is, is, is that you have this discussion of. Um, you have this discussion about revolutions of the belly or mutinies of the bellies. They're the, quite the worst. If you have material conditions, you must be able to do so. Um, and for those in America, there was already this concept that one day this might be the place, um, both loyalist and revolutionary, that this might be the land in which the crown can rule over all. Um, others, however, seeing sort of this veil of invincibility be pierced by the French and Indian War, and also sort of taking a look at their own homegrown um, you know, forms of bravery that have been developed, uh, Williams highlights that actually this idea of imperialism uh, means that the continent is theirs for the taking of the crowns. Alongside that, I know that others like Murray Rothbard have written numerous amounts of text on, you know, this source for liberty, the sort of libertarian exegesis on this political revolution that took place here. And I think that Williams's idea that this is more of an imperial ambition as much as it is a strive for independence and for their own empire kind of come to a fall, uh, come to a head. And I think that they actually complement each other rather well, although I don't think Williams and Murray Rothbard would have ever gotten along in an academic environment, one being a more um, radical libertarian, the other one being um, much more of a, uh, you know, a Wisconsin Midwest uh, kind of man. Um, although, you know, Williams was born in Iowa, nonetheless, he is most well-known for his time at the University of Wisconsin. Nevertheless, however, I think it's really interesting to, uh, to consider, as he argues, that this idea of empire means that we have to rebel. We see the British crown's desire to impose its taxation, to house its soldiers, to maintain its own control over these territories as uh, deprivation of their rights to go elsewhere. One must consider the Navigation Acts, which had significantly hampered both American trade, which had promoted piracy alongside smuggling, um, but also as well to limit them from outside excursion. Um, this is a grave concern that had been discussed by Benjamin Franklin that, you know, republics, kingdoms, and empires do not last very long and tend to lead to stagnation when it is a small territory with a large amount of crowded people. And you'll notice that the idea that Ben Franklin talks about that Williams is mentioning is something that still gets discussed to this day, that empires don't do well when they're all crowded together, they're all discussing the same things over and over and over again. Um, and it's important for us to consider that when we look at today's form of uh, you, uh, imperialism from the American government. Williams makes it very clear in the first four chapters of his book that what we'll actually be looking at is the idea of empire and democracy. So they don't go very well together. If anything, imperialism clashes with the idea of democracy and a democratic norm in part because there are going to be elites. He sort of acknowledges what often gets described as democratic elitism, 
um, or what people might be more familiar with the Italian school of elite theory, that there are going to be people in charge. Um, you know, America did and still does to some large extent an aristocratic class. One has to consider California, for example. There are, you know, about nine families that do a lot ruling that place. There are still numerous Southern uh, political dynasties as well. And let's mention that the last of political dynasties in America is running for president. There's Kennedy running. And now we're in a rather strange position where discussion about space is still once again being reiterated, whether it's over the idea of immigration uh, or more so when you see um, more coastal parts of the wealthier cities explicating that actually there's a lot of room in the middle, of course, to dilute um, sort of the white um, stock that lives there already in their political voice as it is but also to illustrate that empire can be everywhere and anywhere and that one can come here. These are sort of the things that one has to consider when looking at the historiography of the American empire. Um, but even in the midst of the American revolution, um, you know, we have to take a look at what would be debated with the, the constitution. Um, and there was also this, even inside the, the, the constitutional debates in the 1780s, there's already a lot of discussion over what the country is supposed to be. Are we supposed to be just 13 separate entities just scrambling for its own way? Are we going to be united by confederation only in times of war? Are we going to have a stronger, more authoritative federal government with uh, specific responsibilities? Um, Madison, of course, was you know a, an incredibly intelligent man. Um, and of course, you know, arguing and explaining his position uh, to Thomas Jefferson, his personal friend and a man that he would work for with many years, um, he had said, it may be that a new constitution founded on different principles will have a different operation. I admit the difference to be material. This form of government, in order to effect its purpose, must operate not within a small but extensive sphere. The reason was simple, that Williams explains, extend the sphere and it takes you a greater variety of parties and interests. You make it less probable that the majority of the whole will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens, or if such a common motive exists, it will be more difficult for all to feel it and to act in unison with each other, end quote. He says, Madison was nothing if not comprehensive. He argues that the surplus social space and surplus resources were necessary to maintain economic welfare, social stability, freedom, and representative government. It was the implicit in his related judgments to its agrarian citizens that the best basis for public liberty was an explicit concern for a strong central government to acquire land for such a people and to protect and expand their export trade and to encourage their manufacturers, shipping, and even finance. Not, even was the constitu not only was the Constitution grounded in an imperial logic, but it created a government armed and with a typically mercantilist power over its political economy. Um, the same thing with Madison. You also saw with Alexander Hamilton, who's a part of the Manufacturer Society, and how to best improve the American economy in the wake of its separation from the crown and those imperial protections, and how best can it rapidly catch up now that it is no longer under the protection of the crown. Of course, during the times of the 1780s and the Constitutional Convention and it being debated, um, you know, a lot of the authorities were not just acknowledging the rights of these newly emancipated Americans from the crown, but that uh, they also had to address the issue of empire. Um, Williams writes, quote, Madison's contemporary critics missed one of these essential features of the Constitution. Robert Yates, for example, saw immediately that it would create an empire of existing states, an American version of the United Kingdom. Others, like an old Whig and a Federalist, who offered their views in newspapers and pamphlets, recognized the imperial nature of Madison's logic and prophesied the biggest consolidated empire in human history. Quote, we are vain like other nations, another observer noted in status. We wish to make a noise in the world. We are also, no doubt, desirous of cutting a figure in, uh, cutting a figure in history. We should not reflect, he concluded, that extensive empire is a misfortune to be depreciated. Even so, most of the critics wanted the land and the markets and though their domestic ability that the Constitution was designed to provide through its imperial powers. As a result, they were trapped in a wrenching predicament, accept the Constitution or risk more social unrest like Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts and economic difficulties or termination by an older party like that of Great Britain. The old Whig, for example, understood the dilemma perfectly, but could do no more than plead for a slightly weaker central government with explicit guarantees for the natural rights of free Americans. Only a few, like Governor George Clinton of New York, who had famously argued against the Federalist Papers, explicitly reasserted the validity of Montesquieu's thesis that a republic can only exist inside a small territory. Um, 
but even then he accepted the need that social unrest was a, something that needed to be taken care of. Uh, Jedediah Morse in 1789 had said that the colonies had risen into empire, that it is well known that empire has been traveling from east to west, and probably her last and broadest seat will be America, end quote. Um, something that I think definitely plays a large role here is, is that you're already seeing very early on this imperialist language. I don't think that one should, might take it, I mean, one's going to take issue with the empire as it is now. Um, back then, obviously, probably not. I mean, in the more civilized world of European nations, this was just a commonplace acceptability factor that we're going to have to endure and that we're going to have to compete on the global stage. And at that time, America may not have succeeded. Um, and we had saw that quite clearly, and it hadn't been by the providence of England already at war inside against Napoleon and France and across the world that more resources would have had to have been brought to bear if it wanted to truly conquer and recolonize America of 18, and the War of 1812. Uh, William notes that as well. And instead, we, we see these broader um, ways and means to look at what the bounty of the new world could provide. This Faustian Western form of optimism in which a new nation, a new providence, a new city on a hill, this sort of, you know, philatism, this new Israelism, that somehow it is here, this last great vestige, this last great continent of creation is now going to be the place where it can be settled. And this, of course, is the rhetoric that, you know, still gets debated inside the American left and right to this day. Although clearly in terms of government and power of its elites, we already know who the winner of that discussion was, and it had already more or less won by the time that the frontier had closed at the end of the 19th century. William Appleman Williams in this book doesn't really discuss the importance of Frederick Jackson Turner, albeit in passing reference towards the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, but one really cannot understand enough about Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis about the closing of the frontier. Um, I've written a little bit about it before on Substack, which you can find at theprudentialist.substack.com. But these frontier attitudes that Frederick Jackson Turner writes was the greatest form of Americanization. It was where empire was formed, and it was where people from all stripes could understand the great American imperial project because there was enough land and enough resources that any man from any part of the world could come and carve out their way. He had famously had written that a German could come here and he would lose his Germanness. He would put on his moccasins like the wild Indians, carve out a land for himself, and eventually establish it. That people would come further and further westward in phases. Those that would chart the unknown frontiers, taking care of both savage and beast alike. The second ones who would start begin to settle, both in terms of agriculture, but also towns. And then third and finally, those upon the cities and coasts that would find themselves leaving the eastern seaboard and moving further west to fulfill those towns, to invest, to speculate, and to settle down. Um, that idea, of course, Jackson notes, um, that once the frontier closed, uh, the great sort of Americanization, the great empire of the continent came to an end, and that America and Americans might look outward. And it's very timely to consider that as well, that in the time of the closing of the American frontier, um, we're also seeing the debate um, in, 18, in the 1890s about how to go even further. Um, you know, the closing of the frontier, you know, this is said by the Bureau of Census that in 1890, westward expansion, there was no frontier line. Um, and those are things that are very important for us to consider. Um, but I mean, this is what he wrote. Uh, this book, of course, came out. Um, the influence and the importance of the frontier on American history um, came out in 1893. Well worth your time to definitely read and is well worth buying a copy of if you can get a hold of it. But with the frontier line closed and the frontier being quote unquote conquered, although still plenty of land open for speculation, um, the Wild West was still very much wild in that respect for land investment, the Transcontinental Railroad and such. Um, but sh there's an awful, awful revisionism in the TV show Hell on Wheels, but it does cover what that looked like and to some degree of accuracy. But nevertheless, Williams articulates that once that frontier closed, a lot of people saw this idea that we could export this way of life elsewhere to the world. Something that we still see today, that the old form of Americanization has reinvented itself. And now today, that means that we're going to have a transgender model for Starbucks India. Then by God, is the way of life going to be shown by this secular solemn providence? 
Williams also notes that the secularization of America's political elite was something that goes back as far as time with the English um, Reformation and the wars of religion that in there followed. Um, Williams cites in chapter one that it doesn't really particularly matter if the people in charge believed in anything. Um, but they did know that their people that rallied behind them certainly did come hell or high water and that you have to be able to deliver on the promises of those beliefs. Religion as a political formula is something that Williams uh, acknowledges, even if he doesn't use the term political formula from the Mosca and Pareto sense. Um, but in there, we also begin to see the rise towards the Western frontier after America is founded. And in turn, this is where you get to look at what the country really looks like in terms of an imp imperial state, uh, that we still had a frontier to conquer, that we could be a island similar to Great Britain, which has its territories like Scotland, and Wales, and that we could rule our own, we could rule over these peoples, both of the indigenous kind, but also those of other territories. Um, later on, our foreign policy would become to reflect that, that if we can have them join in with us, they can either become us or they become you know, adjacent or adjunct to us that they have no power. Um, Secretary of War uh, Stimson uh, under FDR's administrations uh, had said that um, famously about Canada at the end of World War II. Uh, additionally, however, one has to consider the fact that Williams's text is articulating this uh, empire must grow and it must expand. And that its leadership already recognized that. Now, one has to understand that, of course, um, Williams is from Iowa. He's in Wisconsin. Uh, he is thoroughly of a new left Yankee historiography. Um, his, I, his views of Henry Clay are not particularly good, neither are they with Calhoun or the American South in general. Um, and we get an interesting definition and a look at sort of what imperial mindsets and what Faustian bargains were made in the war between the states that he goes into. Um, but he does argue, uh, citing the senator uh, Matthew Lyon, 1816. Our system will fit a larger empire than ever than it ever yet existed, and I have long believed that Amer and such an empire will rise in America and give quiet to the world. No more war, peace, quiet under a firm American authority. Uh, again, this sort of political hubris, but also I think comes with this sort of Calvinistic determination. Um, Thomas Jefferson, of course, you know, famously does this, and we talked about this when we examined sort of the. Um, I think it was one of our last episodes of Prudent Observations where we had covered the war with the Barbary pirates, um, these sort of quasi-autonomous uh, states along the North African coast, um, right below, right north of the Saharan Desert, uh, that are, you know, of course, famously part of impressing, um, you know, and attacking American ships, but also played a large role into the narrative of white slavery and is well documented that over the course of two centuries that over three million white Europeans had been enslaved and that the Americans are the latest victims of that. Um, and it is within Thomas Jefferson's mindset that he has to do something about this, both in terms of the Louisiana Purchase, but also to defend American exports and American shipping. These are the success and the keys towards our imperial realm and how we can defend our, ourselves and our posterity. And so with seeking little to no interest in Congress, which we can talk about from the previous episode, um, not only is war against the Barbary states declared, um, you know, this is where we get the famous uh, song with the Marines, but additionally, we also have the Louisiana Purchase. Some had actually objected to the time that the President of the United States had no authority to acquire such a purchase, and it was heavily debated inside the newspapers and the Congress. But eventually, of course, Jefferson going ahead and doing it on both ends, both for national security, but also for the desire to expand, knowing that it was going to be either us doing it on the federal level and officiating it, or it would be happening on an unofficial basis where smaller territories and peoples could inadvertently drag America into war. So bringing, you know, executive authority to bear, uh, Williams notes that Jefferson is really beginning to embrace this imperialist mindset, both for the access to resources and territory, but knowing that more agriculture meant that there was more revenue to collect and expand upon that for our own ventures to subsidize um, northern industry. It is coincidentally that I find Williams's description of the American economy being both a uh, cotton king, but also growing in its manufactures and its immigration in New England and in the North, that uh, the issue of how to maintain the balance between agrarian society 
the balance between the farmer and the investor, the financier and the factory man, the first white collar jobs versus blue collar labor and slavery echoes very similar to what Dr. Uh, Don Livingston from the Abbeville Institute says when he looks at the uh, causes of the war between the states and the War of 1861. Um, it's it, you, well worth your time to look up Don Livingston's work. I find it to be particularly fascinating, and he's one of the last Southern conservatives and last Southern historians of any true merit that is still worth uh, listening to and acknowledging. Um, and in there, you know, Livingston will articulate that the question over why Lincoln had to act um, specifically in the realms of secession. And we have to keep in mind, the idea of secession is not a uniquely Southern concept. During the War of 1812, you have the Hartford Convention where there are disaffected New England states that have no desire um, to be a part of it. Um, and secession was on the table until the war was uh, executed until its conclusion for a peace. And those are the things that I think are well worth considering in the backdrop of this. But uh, you know, famously, when the war breaks out after secession, um, after the first bits of secession and the shots on Fort Sumter have not yet been fired, um, you know, we have Secretary of State Seward and many members of Lincoln's cabinet asking what is to be done um, and what will be done about war. Something's going to just let them pass. And the question famously, although apocryphally attributed to Lincoln is, but what of the revenue? And this is something that Williams also articulates as well in this text, that by the time of the war between the states, um, you know, you're going to find yourself in a rather awkward position for what is to happen here. Um, but more freedom and more empire always comes at a cost. Uh, he argues that Lincoln makes a Faustian bargain in order to keep the South. One must have to conquer a people that is an identity, um, that the war itself would be prosecuted and it would be a war of civilization, but also a greater extent, a um, identity that still exists today. And it's kind of funny when you see um, certain liberals and, of course, uh, uh, migrants that are not from here at any point in time, maybe except the last 60 years, that will latch on to the narrative of a war of Southern extermination for the sole purpose of getting their good boy points for social um, agreement. But before I go too far into the Civil War itself, the end of Chapter 4 has a lovely appendix um, ranging from 1827, starting at 1798, about American interventionist activity, including or excluding declared wars. This does not include wars that Congress formally declared. Um, of course, we have the uh, quasi-war with France from 1798, 1797 to 1800. Uh, of course, you have the first Barbary War, which was not declared by Congress, but rather just simply asking for permission for Congress to let them execute it as it wish. Um, Captain Z.M. Pike in 1806 sent with a platoon of troops invaded Spanish territory at the headwater of the Rio Grande, deliberately and on the orders of General James Wilkinson. 1806 to 1810, the Gulf of Mexico, American gunboats operated from New Orleans against Spanish and French privateers, such as Lafitte off the Mississippi Delta, chiefly under Captain John Shaw and Master Commandant David Porter. Um, I won't read all of them, but some of these are particularly interesting. Spanish Florida, 1816. The United States forces destroyed Nicholas Fort, also called the Negro Fort because it harbored raiders into United States territory. Let's see here. 1818, the Oregon Territory. Uh, the USS Ontario, dispatched from uh, Washington, landed in the Columbia River and Augustin took possession. Um, 1820 to 1826, Africa, naval units raided slave trade pursuant to the 1819 Act of Congress. And another one um, being in Cuba in 1825 in March, cooperating with American and British forces, landed at La Sagua La Grande to capture pirates. And last, but in 1827, I'm sure not too many people knew this one, Greece in October and November, landing um, parties hunted pirates off the islands of Argentiera, Miconi, and Androsa been all over the place, or not really too many much uh, opinions of those at the time to be of a substantial imperial force. But throughout this time, you know, we begin to see this idea of quieting the world, transforming itself, um, you know, not just from, say, Adam Smith's concept of the wealth of nations, um, but the influence also from Locke, but also his reflections in moral and political philosophy which leads to the idea of sort of the progressive, and I definitely I would argue more so now, a, a leftist form of argumentation that America was meant to be a benevolent, progressive, and omnipotent dictator. Um, and these words all kind of ble bleed together. In the, in the text, in pages 111 and 112, you'll see Williams just provide these sort of um, 
bubbles of associations with the words of, you know, benevolent policemen um, and progressive. We're meant to be dynamic, to grant favor, to patronize, to order, to be systematized, and to discipline, to secure, quarantine, and protect. And of course, after the end of the Civil War, we begin to understand the need to secure territory um, outside of ourselves for our own defense. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine is innately an imperial idea. We have to get rid of any sort of foreign power ever coming back from laying claim. Uh, we saw this, of course, with France and Mexico in the 19th century. We saw the importance of Cuba and the difficulties that the American Navy had when trying to blockade the Confederates out of the Mississippi Delta. And that, uh, again, there was this long-standing desire. I know that the sort of Knights of the Golden Circle bit is this post-colonial or post-Confederate idea. But even Jefferson and Madison had discussed the idea that uh, the American territory should expand all along the Gulf of Mexico up into the Yucatan. Hence why President Polk's desire to use the Monroe Doctrine as an effort, to, of course, to preserve white and American Anglo interests in that region. That has not yet really happened, um, and instead, the, you know, the, the Knights of the Golden Circle is just a bunch of individuals of a um, not-so-golden complexion uh, coming north into the United States. But as we um, begin to see America enter World War I, and it begins to establish itself as more of an international power, um, there is a, a long-standing debate inside both progressive and conservative circles in the United States that uh, despite Warren G. Harding's desire to return to normalcy, I think that most people knew that normalcy was never going to go back. Even the uh, cross of gold speech by, you know, longtime Democrat uh, and presidential contender William Jennings Bryan, that uh, the cross of gold that we were coming upon ourselves here was uh, going to come at a substantial cost. And that cost, of course, came empire. And in turn also was American blood and the blood of countless others and cultures to be spilled alongside it. So despite this return to normalcy, despite the, Le um, the League of Nations Treaty dying in its debates in the 1919-1920 session of the United States Congress, especially with the Senate saying no to this, and despite even attempts to sort of limit armament treaties about how we can prevent war like that from ever happening again, uh, the debate over what empire is to be and what reasonable limitations may come would emerge once more uh, in the interwar years and that the Great Depression that would roll around in 1929 ushered in the question once more, is the current state of American empire enough to be maintained or must we look elsewhere and outward once again? Um, and the reason why I'm going straight into this and not paying too much attention to the open door policy is, is that there is an episode of Prudent Observations that you can go look up on the open door policy uh, Secretary of State John Hayes' work on ensuring that uh, America gets its slice of the pie inside of China while under the guise of this progressive territorial uh, integrity of the Chinese kingdom, although uh, famously that does lead to the Boxer Rebellion and a further subjugation of the Chinese people inside there. Um, and he does also make this interesting ethnography point, Williams does, that one of the things that comes inside of this text is, is that at no point in time have we ever, um, amidst our conservative and our um, progressive factions in the United States, never have we gotten to a point where the well, we, we burned our fleet of ships like the Chinese did. We've never gone that inward. Uh, we've always been more of an expansionist mindset, um, outside of maybe some radicals. Um, although today, geopolitical reality um, prevents that from ever being um, you know, a, a true position that, to have nowadays. But the last chapter of the text, and I'm, I'm skipping towards the end for the explicit purpose to get to what he asks about empire as a way of life, because the beginning of the book articulates that this is something that exists, but what are the effective limitations to empire? And throughout the book, you're going to get a beautiful history, and it's a good history um, of where imperialism emerges in the American ideal, both in its sort of, I think, Calvinistic you know, um, Israelism that sort of emerges, but alongside that, the question then comes, how long can we keep this up? And we only get to that question really in the last 20 pages of the book, um, where he begins to write in sincere concern that maybe this is not possible and that maybe we should seriously wonder about restraint 
and what kind of limitations can we achieve? Of course, at the beginning, with the foreword from Andrew Bavich, or Basevich, that uh, he wrote this, of course, in 1979, in the midst of the Vietnam War and our own domestic scandals here at home and a poor economy in the oil crisis. Um, Basevich points out that, hey, you know, what would come later is the election of Ronald Reagan. Um, the Iran hostage crisis comes to an end and it's mourning in America again, which sort of made his questions for self-examination to be swept under the rug once more. And they were asked ever so slightly, I think, only more recently after we had pulled out from Afghanistan in a rather humiliating manner. Um, and then now more so additionally as we begin to challenge um, both Russia and China and sort of these two main fronts, these ideas of Ukraine and Taiwan being the main front, but they're also being fought economically. They're being fought by sanctions and trade and international institutions. The language of empire in an American flavor and an American progressive flavor, talking about things like um, you know, anti-racism, anti-colonialism, uh, integration of the global South into the world economy. Um, you know, we see these this rhetoric out of Russia, China, um, discussion over the BRICS and how to bring you know Africans into the the rest of the West, as Fareed Zachariah might say, but into a way that can be utilized as a more formalized block against sort of the existing um, Western. Uh, American empire. Uh, even they are sort of utilizing this language. Not that empire is a way of life, but empire is a mechanism to reject and to counter other imperial ambitions. There's sort of this progressive, like anti-racist, third-worldist rhetoric that gets utilized, but at the same time, it's the same thing that's conquered a lot of American institutions and acad academia. And we get to see that play out now in this strange debate that we live in. But... Um, you know, towards the end of the text, he, he writes this. Um, this essay, an effort to review our development as an empire and to encourage a searching dialogue among ourselves about the character of our culture, has never attempted to offer a detailed reconstruction of American foreign policy. Some nowadays have. Barry Posen at least has, in a case for restraint. Um, hence, it would be a contradiction to wander off in the blow-by-blow -blow account of recent events, but it does seem useful to explore some contemporary aspects of our way of life. Let us begin our relationship to the National Security Council document number 68 and our civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Let us assume that American leaders, and whatever their prejudices may be, believed that empire would provide others disadvantage, including poor whites, uh, with greater opportunities and rewards. Their most popular euphemism for empire, growth. Uh, was invoked on the grounds that the same share of a larger, ever a ever larger pie would produce improvement for everyone, including Black Americans. An elitist like Dean Atkinson would believe that the minorities and other poor would continue to be patient until the fruits of empire were harvested. But in the war in Korea and the related increase of military spending revealed the true priorities that empire hence dramatized this discrepancy and invoked talking about empire in terms of liberty, freedom, and equality and welfare while denying benefits to large numbers of people at home. LBJ did try his best, of course, but that would resolve in a visceral contradiction in the imperial way of life. He tried to make major improvements here at home with the Great Society, um, while at the same time secure the frontier in Indochina. This proved impossible, and by 1964 to 1965, the dynamics of empire as a way of life left him with no room for, to politically maneuver. And given the legacy of the civil rights movement and the global definition of America's political economy and its security formulated by NSC 68, Johnson was trying to swim for the sky, but at least he tried. And now again, we are getting a new left progressive historiography here, but it does rely on a basic question of how far can you expand things at home and how well can you manage things domestically here? I know that this sort of re this also sort of leads into the Turbo America question. The former president of the United States is on his fourth indictment. Um, traditional Catholics are being investigated by the FBI. Uh, white people are actively discriminated against and are being economically snuffed out by opioids, a shitty job market where more and more immigrants come in here. The question might just be that they can succeed on two fronts in the name of ending injustice in their own um, anti-whitist or their anti-white progressive historiography. Um, however, you know, any efforts to make structural reforms at home would provoke a militant reaction around the classical imperial theme of 
who lost whatever, wherever. Johnson tried to finesse this issue, and therein lies the problem of great drama. From the fog of trepidation and the dread continued influence of the conduct of foreign affairs from President Johnson now to President Nixon to the Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, their bone marrow anxiety provides the key to resolving an apparent paradox in the diplomacy that sought to stabilize relations with the Soviets while simultaneously recognizing the communist governments of China, falsifying official records to hide an expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia, launching efforts to subvert an elected socialist government in Chile, and supporting a dictatorship in Iran when there was um, well, that was instrumental in raising uh, oil prices. Again, we're seeing these sort of progressive historical debates and things that play out. And again, this was written in 1979. But I, it does raise that interesting question um, because he cites Kissinger sort of being the, the inheritor of this like Anglo-American idea of like racial superiority of like, oh, you know, we can, who says that they need to have uh, elect a government that we don't like that's just going to cause problems. Um, and it, for me, it just it kind of hits kind of clearly that that's been the case throughout American history. Uh, that there was sort of until recently this racial component. They don't like white people anymore. Although that sort of superiority complex with America now exists and it's weird calvocate of olding, o aging and dying out uh, elites. Um, Lord knows that those that are running our foreign policy today, when they finally die and the last cold warriors slip this mortal coil, uh, we're really in trouble. Um, you know, so we begin to acknowledge the, the same old debate that you see from uh, the interrogation of American imperialism. Uh, and as he looks at it, you know, and he sees that we're, you know, doing things without the consent of the governed, we're doing things without um, acknowledging our leaderships, nothing's being done procedurally correct. Um, are we just going to find ourselves slipping into a tyranny while nothing gets better at home? Those are questions that get asked. But, you know, now looking towards the issue of... Um, our, he, he acknowledges our limitations of history and our limitations of trying to look at policy, in part because Americans don't have the capability to see, or not just Americans, but all people, and this is something that on the political right I think is very important that Williams points out, that our vision is really good at focusing on one or two things at once, and then it never expands past that. It never goes past uh, those little issues. We have a, you know, our our Belton Gushong is really but primarily focused on one or two things and we can never fully examine what causes government to work or what causes these things to happen. It's a big reason why economic modeling can be, you know, difficult, you know, Oh, um, assuming all else stays the same. Well, all else doesn't stay the same. And we have to consider that. Um, but so he begins to, you know, look at our, our wars and our conflicts over oil, both in Iran, he brings up Zionism, and how on earth can we manage to deal with an empire both at home and abroad? Um, and so he says, as the crisis in America deepened, Kissinger said it all in one sentence. The United States must somehow shape the events in light of our own purposes. A marvelous, subtle definition of empire. But note the particular use of somehow. What a delightful way to avoid any coming to terms with the reality of empire. But to evade that moment of truth means going to war. No candor, no flight from reality, more flight, no peace, no chance to finally confront the central challenge. Is the idea and reality of America possible without empire? And he says, or to define this issue in these ways. Is America even imaginable only on a global scale? Or are we, intellectually, to do any better than to sermonize on the theme that endless growth is crucial to our social psychological health, that we are unable morally to share the world, say, with Palestinians as well as the Zionists, on an equitable basis? If you think yes to those questions, then hunker down for what James Baldwin called the fire next time. We will suffer as what we did unto Hamburg, Dresden, and Tokyo. We will suffocate, sizzle, and fry all in the name of defending the proposition that democracy is impossible without empire. But consider another question. Is it possible to create and sustain a democratic culture without con conquering or otherwise controlling and wasting a grossly inequitable share of social space and resources? If your answer to that question is yes, then you declare yourself a pioneer of what Karl Becker might have called the ultimate American frontier meaning you are prepared to challenge your assumptions and join John Adams in accepting the irksome annoyances involved with asserting a means of independency. 
come along and certainly more challenged to walk along Indian trails with Daniel Boone. And surely we can do better than Jefferson or Lincoln, those heroes of morality and having it, which ever while evading the truth of empire is a way of life. It is time to turn in the credit cards and stop passing the buck onto the next generation. If you are reading to bestir yourself face to face the issue, we can take comfort and courage from the impressive and delightfully variegated group of Americans who created the tradition of speaking truth to empire. We need to stop here for a moment and avoid confusion. To be honest, history must tell the story of those who won, why they won, and how they intend to exploit their spoils and victory. But also history must tell us about those who offered an alternative vision and discuss the value of those different views. So let us think about the people who lost. Now is the time to learn from them, to tell the truth, an impressive lot of it. Those people who said no to empire is the only definition of democracy, a delightfully unclassifiable collection of women and men, like that of John Taylor, a slave owner from Caroline County, Quaker abolitionist from Pennsylvania, as well as those like Philip A. Philip Randolph. There are thrice over certified conservatives such as John Quincy Adams and Herbert Hoover. There are radicals of your choice, such as that of Eugene Debs or Helen G. Douglas. The exciting and profound important things about all these things that are human is that they began as an advocates of a system based on empire and then became, through their own experience and reflection, the essence of doing and becoming history, people who questioned and challenged the conventional relationship between democracy and empire. It works. It happens. Down the line. I live in a non-academic community. You have to earn your way in. My way is pool. I like to game and play it well. Professors playing pool with loggers and truck drivers and gippo fishermen properly go through an apprenticeship. You beat us at our game and we'll try yours. Now my game at pool is to play the capitalist machine tables in a way that most nearly duplicate the real game of pool. No slop, no errant ball counts. You call your shots and bank the eight ball. The fascinating thing that people like to be challenged in the best way they can in the most difficult circumstances. Americans like a tough game. And he concludes here. We come down to these questions. And there are four. One, who makes policy on the basis of what perceptions and interests? Here, I think of Herbert Hoover trying to control the bankers. We have a right to know that Hoover lost in the 1920s and that we have lost even to this day. We do not know. Two, assume empire is necessary. What is the optimum size of empire? And what is the proper meaning, moral, as well as pragmatic means of structuring, controlling, and defending that empire so that it will practice and produce welfare for democracy to the largest number of its imperial population? Number three, what is the minimum effective size of that empire? And four, what happens if we simply say no to empire? Or do we have to either the imagination or the courage to say no to empire? These are our responsibility to answer our, these questions. It has to do with how we live and how we die. We as a culture have run out of imperial games to play and assume the worst. Empire as a way of life will lead to nuclear death. Community as a way of life will lead for a time to less than, nece less than necessary. Some of us will die, but how one dies is terribly important, and it speaks to the truth of how we live. That's how Williams ends the text. I quite like those four questions because I feel like some of that's been answered and some of those have uh, not been answered at all. The question of how we had lost to mercantile and capital interest, I think, in large part becomes that it was easier to rule with a, a bit of anarcho-tyranny for the state to, to choose its winners and losers and to associate some of the more managerial bits of our society over to those that were best at making money. After all, the idea that Tom Friedman of the New York Times famously wrote before we started bombing in Sarajevo um, was that no country with two McDonald's had ever gone to war with each other. This M Mickey D's theory of peace had quickly evaporated in the early 1990s. But at the same time, the question of how large can an empire be before it meets geopolitical reality as well as cultural reality, I don't think has been answered yet. Some say that America's been, never been stronger before. Nicolo Soldo and the Turbo American thesis indicates that we're doing quite well for ourselves, that uh, actually the U.S. regime will continue to truck along um, however, the current counteroffensive in Ukraine does not seem to be going well. Uh, the next aid package of $200 million has been approved, and we have spent an ungodly amount of money uh, and treasure and blood uh, trying to make that work and to bleed Russia. And instead, we've just turned a country that had its own history and its own people into a wasteland. And we're watching a population of primarily two Christian peoples being killed um, while a Jewish president criticizes and silences its church alongside uh, demanding more money from us. Can we say no to empire? I don't know. It's sort of baked into the American question. 
and baked into sort of the American ideal. Empires do not last forever. They inevitably prepare and plan and try their best to last as long as humanly possible. This global crusade, however, our definition of empire is radically changed. It is what uh, Dr. Gottfried calls a moral crusade, a course for crusade. Um, we are haunted by the long specter of the Third Reich, and in turn, everything must be declared fascist. Even the language we see has its own form of anti-fascism uh, in Russia as well. It's claimed to denazify Ukraine. We live in a very strange society in a point in time where is this empire actually effective? William Appleman Williams is asking the question, can you maintain an empire and still provide in blessings of liberty and economic prosperity for our posterity? Clearly not. The form of globalism and the American empire that articulates this, as Darren Beatty likes to call it, the global American empire, globalism doesn't particularly do very well. We don't have a mercantilist society. We do not send people out like the Chinese do in places like Kazakhstan or Ethiopia in order to facilitate colonial intrigue. Instead, we have people come here, and we have Chinese citizens that join the military and sell trade secrets to the Chinese. We have individuals that come here and colonize us, whether that be Indians in the tech sector or in entertainment. Well, we already know how that one plays out. The current form of empire we have is globalism. It does not work. It does not last. And Lord knows that uh, the questions that he puts there at the end, while somewhat progressive and while a leftist bent to his text, offers a keen observation for us to consider when we look at the state of the American empire. Most American people don't have a particular say in their government at all. I'm quite fond of the Colin Quinn interpretation of how Americans are represented in government, that if you're upper middle class or wealthy, you can call your congressman or your senator, and if you really wanted to try as a lower middle class person, you could stand on the phone for several hours on end calling um, you know, your secretary to your congressman or local rep, and then if you're poor like the rest of us, you get to yell at the radio or television. I think there's a great deal of truth to that in that respect. Uh, empire does not represent the core class of Americans that built the empire originally of the last century or the century beforehand. The frontier closed. It's now ran and operated by the wealth inside of its cities. While they claim and desperately proclaim that one billion Americans is the way in which things can be solved. Um, empire is a way of life by William Appleman Williams is a text that is well worth your time, even if you don't mind new left and progressive historiography. I do think that the idea of imperialism being tied in aid to capital gains and sort of the venture of superiority, both on a religious or racial sense, does hold a lot of truth. Definitely for the United States of America and its own position in the epoch of history. Um, but the questions he asked toward the end, I do not think have been answered, not in any meaningful way. Um, some have tried to answer in their limited capacity. Barry Posen has with his 2018 book, Restraint, a new grand strategy for the United States. And others have simply pointed out that it may have already been too late and our loss and our rise of empire. Uh, no longer are we the progressive benevolent policeman. We are instead someone that is benevolent on the face of things. But if one takes off that mask, one is ready to make sure that your children are being force fed Lupron, whether you like it or not. So that concludes sort of my discussion uh, on this text. Um, I'm going to just go through the super chats real quick and then we will wrap it up for this evening. Um, it's been a very, it's been a long uh, week, uh, and actually, it's been a long couple of weeks. I've been busy trying to finish off some writing projects for others. Um, but let's uh, let's just get into it, shall we? It's good to to see you all in that respect. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll uh, take a look here. Um, so, Hassan Benali asked me, are there any opinions on the coups in Africa lately, such as the one in Niger and the neighboring states, reacted as forced reinstitution of elected leaders? Um, well, I, I do certainly think that you're going to see more of that play out. Um, everyone likes to think that we have conflict with other imperial powers or great powers inside just these areas of Ukraine or in the areas of Taiwan and the South China Sea. But no, uh, one has to consider the backdrop that uh, the ECOWAS, the um, community of East economic community of East African states that is part of the African Union, it's all composed of, you know, post-colonial territories of the Portuguese, French, and English, um, although to the south of ECOWAS also includes some former German territories as well, like Benin and Togo. Uh, I'm not surprised. I know that there's already been reports that, um, you know, the private military company uh, Wagner has been attacked by 
Islamic State forces or Al Qaeda forces. And it was very interesting to see the rhetoric that came into Western headlines describing them as, um, oh, we're, we're actually uh, dealing with this rather than that. And I, I thought that that was something that was rather interesting um, and uh, it's sort of the world that we live in now. But additionally, I think the other thing to consider is, is uh, I can just turn that up real quick. The other thing to really consider in this fact is that um, you've got the world going towards itself uh, in Russia and China have a lot of foreign direct investment in there. There's a lot of allegations that Russia's already in Niger. A lot of this is coming out of Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. But yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, it's definitely going to go that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's really where we're at. And I think that it's only emerging. I don't know if any sort of force from ECOWAS has been forced upon there, but you have to keep in mind that inside of Niger, there's already like American and French military uh, equipment forces and personnel that are already there. There's going to be a lot of that coming in uh, pretty damn soon. So yeah. But um, those are the things to, to consider in, in the future. Um, but uh, so that's really what I have for this book. I still think that it's uh, an interesting bit of historiography. The new empire that we have now, as Sean Wyland points out, as Chad, is very much the um, foundational myth that we operate under. And it's sort of the narrative that we exist and that we have going for ourselves. And yeah, that's definitely um, to consider there. Um, but Joshua BB, you know, states that America should shed its coastal states and assimilate um, central Canada to Alaska. Well, I mean, Canada has also been vastly wiped out unless you want some sort of Fitzpatrick War narrative going on um, with the Yukon. I mean, maybe potentially there. But again, this is going to require people to act as non-state actors. You're going to have to do this yourself. Um, and having any sort of war in Africa, I really don't want to have happen. Um, but I have a feeling that people are going to be there. But I, what does this make sense? I, I don't see, you know, shed its coastal states and assimilate central uh, Canada to Alaska. Not going to happen. Like, I mean, no one's in charge of government right now. It's not going to happen. Absolutely nuts. Um, but yeah, like, let's let's be realistic here in this respect. Uh, whoops. And then, of course, Luthan Plar for $10 says, Rereading Lord of the Rings and realizing how hard it is to get a right-wing alliance now easily left can unite in the fastest. Uh, there's no ring of power to destroy, though, so I wonder what civil, um, if the civil rights bill comes close. I think it's probably it. That's been sort of the Christopher Caldwell thesis, that that's the way that it's going to go. That, hey, you can just have um, everything organized under a central value of civil rights and anti-fascism, and that's what they can be united under. Um I think it's what's been increasingly learned over the last 10 years that discussions over uniting the right um, usually gets uh, sorted out by petty disputes, egoism, infiltration, and the federal government bringing all authority to bear down on it. Um, things will be more decentralized and more asymmetrical in the future, and I think that that's the way it goes. Um, but uh, genuinely, I really do think that we're going to... We've already come to the last election. That was 2020. I, they're trying desperately to imprison people for tweets and the former president of the United States is on its fourth um, indictment. So, I mean, only time will tell, but I, I'm not as optimistic and one must uh, prepare for that. Um, but SCOTUS is going to get more leftist in the future, especially as more conservative uh, justices die out. I mean, once, you know, Clarence Thomas and uh, goes, things are going to be um, moving there. But yeah, predicting the future is hard. I don't ever claim that I have predictions. The only thing I think I've ever remotely got right... Um, the only thing I, I've gotten right was just simply saying that if the Russians invade uh, Ukraine, it'll get turned into a long, drawn-out, bloody conflict like Syria with a lot of proxy and a lot of uh, money getting poured into it, regardless of what the American people want. But that's the way with all foreign intervention these days. Um, but I'm going to end things here. And so... Uh, Thank you all for tuning in. I was also streaming this to Twitter as well. So thank you to the people that tuned in and listened over there. Um, I'm over here on, at Mr. Potentialist on Twitter. You can find me here on YouTube in the links down below the YouTube description. This will go up on Odyssey, Rumble, and uh, Substack later on as well once I get the audio up. And with that, I wish you all a fond evening. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Take care.